On this week's episode of Tiger Turf Talk, we host Mr. John Ludwig, the head of sports turf and grounds at Leicester City in England. What an incredible experience for our students. It honestly was such a great podcast with such great information, whether it was something to do with cultural practices or something that just had to do with living your life to the fullest um, in the sense of being a good person and conducting oneself in the proper way. Um, Mr. Ludwig offers so much uh, and in this episode you're going to learn about all the different aspects of what he cares for when it comes to not just turf grass but people, uh, industry development, uh, making people aware of what the possibility of people like our students and what they can do with their lives uh, and have an impact on this incredible industry. Um, it truly was an honor and an incredible experience to have Mr. Ludwig on and talk about everything that he does with Leicester City. Um, they recently have developed a sports turf academy that has truly taken on this whole embodiment of a college university that is centered around sports turf. Um, it is such a unique and such a uh, futuristic way of approaching education. And it really, it really is such an incredible thing to hear. Um, and we would be honored to be a part of it in some way, like we discussed in this podcast. It's just, it, it truly is great to hear all the different aspects that could be available to anyone in the world really and really get to see what has the best opportunity to be successful in this life you know and just to hear what he's done in his career and how far he's come and what he's developed um, even in just seven years with Leicester City um, it truly is an inspirational uh, episode and we hope that all of you can gain what our students did in this time and um, we really we hope you enjoy this episode of Tiger Turf Talk. Good afternoon, everyone, and good evening from England. Um, welcome to the 32nd episode of Tiger Turf Talk. I'm your host, Drew Miller. We have an incredible guest today. It is the head of sports turf and grounds for Leicester City, Mr. John Ledwig. How are you doing today, sir? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Jake. Really good. We are so excited to have you on. I've actually been a huge fan of yours for a very long time for all the work that you do. Uh, I want to start off by saying congratulations. I saw your post the other day. Uh, a baby boy, correct? Yeah, baby boy's on the way. Uh, to add to the baby girl we've got who's just gone to bed. <laughs> They've just we'll, put her to bed. And, we'll try uh, to keep, we'll keep it quiet so we don't yeah. anything. Uh, so... Um, I sort of want to start off because, again, uh, I had just told you we, we I've been watching you for a long time from over here just as a sort of a turf nerd, you know. Um, and I'm sure you were very upset about uh, them banning the designs and the mowing patterns as much as I was because, again, yeah. it was like every time something new came out, it was always you, you know. Um, <laughs> Could you sort of speak to what was sort of your inspiration with that stuff? Uh, I mean – we called you sort of the godfather of striping. <laughs> I don't know if anyone ever told you that, but it, no, me and my classmates in college had all were always like, "Oh man, there's another one! Oh, there's another one!" So, could you sort of see doing now? <laughs> seriously, I mean, the one with the uh, Leicester City uh, insignia on the center was insane. It was incredible. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. could you sort of speak to what your sort of inspiration for, uh, to all of that and where you started to do that and why it sort of came to fruition? Yeah, well, I, I sort of I, I started uh, playing around with them when I was when I was just started really at my, my career um, back at Coventry City, and I was uh, in charge of the training ground when I was 19 years old, and I took the liberty there to start practicing, and um, really it came about more so with the fact that Leicester were on such a, a unique journey that year. We were top of the Premier League, and that year we won the league as well. Um, so I thought it'd just be for me it was a great opportunity to showcase what groundsmanship is about uh, and what can be achieved and I guess you could almost call it a bit of a, a marketing story in a way because it really did raise awareness so like even speaking to you guys what we are now four or five years on 
people are still talking about the patterns that we did and that was exactly the ambition really is to get people talking and raise awareness of what we do um you know it's uh it's still it's it's a professional trade over here and, and we're getting taken a lot more seriously than we ever have been in i've been involved in the trade now for 20 years and you know to see its evolution from when i started to where we are now there's been huge leaps but i still think there's more to do and um, so i just sort of thought i'll use my platform i'll use the platform that leicester city uh, uh, provided me um and give it a go and uh, we did and it just took off and it rocketed and I came over to the States for the STMA and I got stopped every five minutes to talk about the patterns. And still today, I still talk about the patterns. And it's great because it's, it's, um, it really served its purpose across the world and it reached all corners of the globe. You know, messages from the States, from Australia, from India, from Thailand, from all over the, all over the world, really. It was, it was great, um, a great experience for us. And it was, uh, wasn't about me. It wasn't about, you know, showing off what I can do. It was more showcase for the industry and try and get people interested and in talking about it and they did and it worked so i'm proud of it but you were the best at it i promise you <laughs> that um, so you. i, I want to sort of go with what you're saying sort of bring in awareness um is it it's the grounds managers association correct yeah they just yeah, recently uh, did a uh grounds manager week correct and sort of brought even more awareness. Could you sort of speak to how you guys were played a role in that at Leicester City and how, again, just you're bringing awareness to the industry, sort of how this has helped you in sort of highlighting the, the workers that you have and the work that you've done? Yeah, I mean, that, that initiative was, it was a fantastic thing brought forward by the, the GMA. Um, you know, it wasn't just about raising awareness for the guys like us at, at the top of the, of the tree, if you want to call it that. Um, but it was about raising awareness for all the, the volunteers and the, you know, the local, local volunteers at grassroots level that are putting maybe even more of a shift in than some of us at the top level, um, you know, providing pitches for young children to play on and, you know, giving up their own free time to do that role all the way through to professionals um, at our level. And it was a really important week uh, for us to engage with. It was really important as an, as an initiative to give people an insight and to raise that awareness. And yeah, it tied into exactly the sort of thing that, you know, I love to advocate is, is to get people talking about the industry, get to people talking about what we do, hopefully to secure the next generation of, of young people or even older people, you know, who want a career change, which we've seen here at Leicester. There's been a few, um, we've got a few apprentices, as they're called, which I guess you could call students. Um, and they're in their 30s because they fancied a career change and we've inspired them to that. And uh, yeah, it's it's the power of what that um, campaigns like that can do. It just raises that awareness, which is which is what we need, really. You know, and it's something that I advocate and got behind 100 um, percent. And obviously with our profile and what we do as a club within the industry and, and what we've done as a department, um, you know, it's been it was really crucial that we were part of that. And I made sure that all of my team really got on board and I made sure that they hammered Twitter <laughs> raising that awareness and, and tweeting and hashtagging every single day of the week to give people an insight into what we were doing. And it worked, you know, it was, uh, it was a really fantastic initiative, one that I was proud to be part of. Absolutely. Um, this is sort of a personal question. Do you have a favorite mowing pattern that you love to do? Um, and has there been any discussion? I know it's probably not really on the top of their radar, especially with COVID and everything, of bringing back those patterns. Has there ever been a discussion, or is it sort of stuck where it's at? Or <laughs> yeah, I think I mean it was it stuck where it's at. I think you know the the official line as to why it was stopped was uh, you know they wanted to be more in line with the bodies like FIFA and UEFA. So if we have a a UEFA game or if we are lucky enough to host international fixtures, there are very strict rules around mowing patterns and they have to be a certain measurement and there have to be so many blocks per pitch and all the rest of it. And I think really the Premier League wanted to um, standardise themselves a bit more. Um, we also had some feedback that it was confusing the uh, linesmen, the, like the touch judges, if you want to call it that. <laughs> yeah, I know. And that was uh, part of the reason why they told us we had to stop. Um, so, yeah, it's there's no discussions about bringing them back. I don't think they'll probably ever come back, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, I was waiting for some sort of revolt when it, <laughs> you know, some sort of uprising once uh, they were banned. But uh, let us know we're there. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you've, you've got my back, right? Yeah. So we've, um, but I don't think that I'm honestly don't think they'll ever come back. We've got a potential opportunity to do a little bit of work when we have friendlies, um, and 
we've we're hosting the final uh, game of the women's championship. So that's our, our women's team, women's soccer team. And uh, we've got a little bit of a license to potentially do something there. So watch this space. We might we might drag one out. But in terms of a favourite, um, oh, there's so many. Um, but ones, you know, I don't know. I, lo I love them all. They're all great. Uh, the one with the, obviously, like you said, with the, the, Le the Leicester crest uh, in the centre circle was... That took a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of planning, um, but it was probably one of the most effective. So I like that one. That holds a place in my heart for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, we really enjoyed that one. Yeah, it, it was incredible. And I mean, it's funny because a lot of people, um, I want to sort of say, a lot of people are like, wow, that looks fantastic. You know, just to like the, the fan's eye and whatnot, obviously you're trying to bring that out and great, but there's so much more that goes into it and the science, the cultural practices and everything like that. Could you sort of uh, speak to the different uh, aspects of your cultural practices that allow you to do things like that and allow your field to look pristine? Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, I would never have attempted the patterns had the pitch not looked perfect and it had not been healthy and it had not, we'd not addressed all those things first because you know, we talk about it a lot um, within my team. And when we explain to the young people, it's, it's all about sort of building the layers of the cake. You know, so each layer of the cake is another scientific twist on what we're doing or an addition of nutrient or a cultural practice that we have to do to keep the plant healthy, um, which, then, which then helps us to produce the icing on the cake, which is the patterns or the, how green it is or all those sort of things. And I often make the analogy to, to some of the young guys that are coming through that we treat the pitches and the turf like we would an athlete so through all the week through all the weeks in a build-up to a big game we'll be tweaking the nutrition we'll be making sure the foundations of, of what's needed in terms of a good nutritional program is there and um, we'll be building up sort of carbohydrate sugars to make sure that when it goes into a game it's an absolute peak performance um, and then as soon as the game's finished we're back into a recovery cycle so straight after the game we'll be putting on some aminos some sugars and um, some potassium silicates and what we're doing is just Sort of you can imagine that you've just played a football match or you've played a sport um the, the leaf is no different the, the plant is no different and it needs to recover and recover quickly because you know the quicker we can get the recovery is the quicker we're on to the next game and i often say that that cycle sort of begins for the next game straight after the game that's just happened so you know it is a there's a lot more to it and there's a lot more science goes into it but you know certainly when we're trying to teach the, the young guys coming through making those sort of sport analogies really helps it to sink in. And then once they get the concept of what we're trying to achieve from a pro program perspective, then we start delving into the real science and start talking about, you know, the, the type of products we put on and what they do for the plant and their modes of action and help them understand, help me understand sometimes and <laughs> remember to be fair. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, there's so much more goes into it and the patterns are just the icing on the cake really, to be honest. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love how you talked about just all the different aspects that go into it after the fact and sort of understand that. And again, I'm a teacher and I'm still trying to learn. So yeah. <laughs> completely every, day school day, right? every, yeah. day. <laughs> every day is a school day. I like it. Um, sort of to go along with that, what is sort of your field? What's the makeup at uh, King Power? Is that correct? Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. What's, what's the... Uh, Soil profile, what's the type of turf grass you're growing? Uh, what's what sort of special and what have you done to sort of bring it into, your, like you said, I, I, again, I'm not sure how many, how many years you've been there, but 20 years. What have you sort of had to make your own field in the end, sort of where you are today? Um, I think I read something about a five-year plan uh, that yeah. you did for pitch improvement. Uh, could you yeah, that's that? right. Well. Uh so, so when I when I joined the club, I've been at the I've been at Leicester City uh, seven years now. Uh, prior to that, I've been at Coventry City and Aston Villa. Um, and when I came in, you know, the the pitches hadn't had any real investment for around fourteen years. Um, and it was one of the remits that I had to to sort of provide a plan to improve the pitches and bring them up to standard. Because at that point, we were in the Championship, which is the league below the Premier League, but we were at the top of that league, ready to be promoted. So we were preparing everything, all the infrastructure to facilitate Premier League football um, so that five-year plan was was structured around the training facility at the time um, and you know we I, within my first six weeks I, I had I was thrust in front of the board of directors to produce this five-year plan and I'd only literally walked in the door you know, six weeks prior to that so that was quite daunting 
Um, but I set out my plan and, and I told them what we wanted to achieve and told them my aspirations personally and my aspirations for the team. Um, and I, I walked out of that room with £1.2 million in my pocket to go and start the process. Well done. Um, well done. Yeah, which was, uh, it, was a, it was a fantastic achievement because, you know, I'd uh, been at Coventry and a club that was struggling at the time, you know, sort of a lower division club. Um, I'd never been used to that sort of money. I'd never seen that. That was just like I'd won the lottery. It was phenomenal. Um, but then obviously with anything that you get investment for, you have to prove it and you have to make it work. Um, so, you know, and that was the purpose of the five-year plan. Um, and within the second year, because of the way we'd proved the system worked, um, that they reinvested then in the second year, the whole five-year plan. So they had a complete faith in what we'd done. So we were over the moon. Um, but in terms of the King Power Stadium itself, that pitch is actually due for a full reconstruction this summer. We've just had it approved on Thursday. Um, so that pitch itself is is nearing 20 years old. You just get um, stuff done over there. Jeez. Yeah, we're just there. 1.5, just, just another one, another one. Yeah, okay, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, it's some, there's serious money um, involved, but with that comes serious responsibility and you know, I'm not, I don't like sort of banding figures around like it's some sort of bravado or anything like that. You know, all those investments have come from hard work, a lot of planning, a lot of presentations from me to the board, to the chief executive, to the owners um, to secure that investment. Um, and their faith in giving me that sort of money um, and giving me that level of investment uh, comes from proving myself and, and the team proving themselves and producing the goods. And you know, I'm really proud that we do that. Um, and that's helped us achieve all that investment. So you know, I say the King Power Stadium is is now sort of 18 years old. It's a Desso Grassmaster pitch, which is the polypropylene um, stitch fibres. Uh, the construction is 125 mil of gravel carpet. Uh, on top of that is all the heating pipes and the pipe infrastructure for the irrigation. 200 mil of like a coarse sand and then 100 millimetres of uh, root zone, which is a 90-10 mix. Um, and then the, all the synthetic fibres are stitched into that down to a depth of 180 millimetres. Um, but that was done, you know, the stitching of the pitch itself was done 11 years ago. The pitch was 20 years ago. So we're due for a brand new system to come in this summer, which it will do. Um, and that incorporates an um, uh, under pitch air system, which you might know as sub air. You may have heard of sub air. I'm sure you've heard of sub air. Um, it's not the sub air system. It's a version of it that we've got over here in the UK. Um, and that will form sort of quite an expensive um addition to a normal construction for us for the for the King Power Stadium. Um, we've also obviously maybe it's the same over in the States. We, we know we need to be more sustainable. We need to look at how we manage our products, how we manage discharging water into into the storm drains and all the rest of it. So we've invested um, about hundred thousand pounds of this project into reclaiming all of our water and reusing it on the pitch, which is something that we don't do at the minute. But with the pitch being 20 years old, there wasn't really much talk about sustainability 20 years ago as much as there is today so um we've got um a few of the little nice nifty bits we've collapsed the ball um ball stop netting so when they warm up we've got ball stops and they fall into the ground um our permavoid system which replaces the gravel carpet so that basically is a void that sits in the same sort of depth of profile as the gravel carpet would and with the air system that helps the air move more efficiently through the base of the root zone um, and helps us when we get to the point where the pitch is a little bit older to really force air up through the surface and, and break up that sub layer. So, yeah, there's uh, the King Power's up for a massive overhaul this summer. So you'll see it probably all over our social medias because we'll, we'll be tracking it as it goes because um, it's, it's a significant amount of money um, and, you know, but something that is absolutely needed. Um, and it's almost it's the last piece of the puzzle. So we built our new training facility, which I'm sure we'll talk about shortly. Um, and that That's was definitely. another... Yeah, another significant investment from the football club into to our facilities. Um, and the, the old training ground, which is the one that we left, is now our centre for the women's. So that's our women's football um, club, if you want to call it that. Um, and then we've got, obviously, the Kimpa Stadium, which is the last piece of that puzzle in terms of investment. So once that's done, I can sort of breathe for the first time in seven or eight years, which will be nice, but I'll constantly be looking for something else to do, probably. <laughs> <laughs> The ne it's the never ending thing. Um, and I, I love how you said like you had to prove. And again, when you talk about 1.2 million pounds, like that is nothing. That's way more than a million dollars, guys. Just a heads up. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. But 
proving yourself. And then the next year after that much being invested, they just go, you know what, here, here's it all. You've done such a good job. I think that's phenomenal and awesome. Uh, yeah. Is there anything uh, new and interesting that you're hoping to uh, come in with King Power uh, other than the sub air and whatnot that hopefully will give you sort of an edge against the other uh, pitches in uh, your area? I mean, the thing is, is that apart from the the air system and the permavoid crate system, uh, which gives us a better efficiency in terms of heating and an air movement, um, a lot of a lot of what sets what may set us apart, what sets a lot of people apart, is how you manage it. Then, um, so you know what we're you know we're looking at sort of more sustainable ways with the and we'll talk about the turf academy shortly. But the whole creation of the turf academy is is made us question what we do a lot more. Um, you know a lot of some of the decisions that we make even at the highest level sometimes is based on some pseudoscience and what you read in pamphlets and when you look out the window and it works um you know we go into a bit more depth than that but in general the industry can move like that sometimes um and you know we we are now looking at ways that we can elongate how our fertilizers are uptaken for example how much more organic material we can add in to give us a bit more longevity so we're not spending as much money on conventional fertilizers that go straight into the drain and out into the storm drain. So, you know, in terms of giving us the edge, you know, I just think that we, we've just got to do what we keep, what we're already doing. There's a few tweaks in there because it's a sterile brand new surface. So we've got to build a lot of microbial activity and a lot of um, sort of like the soil improvement conditions, I guess you, you could call it that. Um, we've, we've got to make that sterile root zone unsterile. And a, and a great sort of habitat for all the good bacteria to live in. And that gives us some, helps gives us that edge in terms of recovery and retention and nutrient and all the rest of it. So yeah, there's nothing from a physical point of view from investment that we're doing too much different. Um, but I think the way that we maintain it, given this blank sheet of paper and given a pitch that is gonna be consistent, which the King Power at the minute is probably one of the most inconsistent pitches I've ever worked on because of its age. Um, it's uh, it, it's just going to be a real nice blank canvas for us to work on and prove what we can do over and above what we've already done. Absolutely, and I think I think the 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 most incredible part of it is that it is twenty years old. Like that is absolutely insane. If you talk to any professional sporting team in the United States, they'll say if it's more than five years old, you're crazy. You know what I mean? So, um. Could you sort of speak to sort of how your practices might shift? Again, you were talking about the microbials and everything and making sure that it's not sterile anymore. What is it that you're going to be focusing on in those first couple of years to make sure that you have that health? Obviously, it's going to be healthy, but maintain sort of that that premier level of brand new pitches, you know? Yeah. And like I say, it's sort of, it's all about building up the, the profile and that soil condition. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of research into humic acids and fulvic acids and mycorrhiza and all those things. And we're going to try and inoculate as much as we physically can into the profile and um, those sort of materials at construction. So they're going to be blended into the upper 120 mil of root zone uh, that the pitch will sit on because that's where most of the activity happens in that upper hundred it's the key bit it's where the roots get all their goodness from um, so it's really about trying to improve that structure if you like and obviously um, there's there's little or no sort of cation exchange capacity within a sterile root zone so all the negatively charged nutrients you put in have got nothing positive to hang on to because it's just sterile sand so we're looking at some of the additives that we may put into the, the root zone as well that can almost give the the energy something to grab hold of so that we can hold on to those nutrients a little bit longer um you know we we monitor and manage our soil profile on a monthly basis and at the stadium in particular um and we'll tweak our program according to the outcome of those results so we're not looking at we are obviously always looking at the health of the plant on the top you know but what we're looking at is how that translates down into the into the soil profile and how it's interacting with the soil so whenever we take a soil sample we'll take a leaf tissue and we'll see how much nutrients available and how much has been taken up. And then we tweak our programs accordingly just to sort of try and keep a balance. Um, and stereotypically, um, the sand profiles that we op operate on are very, very low in pH, which, which locks up a lot of the nutrient really badly. So what we'll look to do as well is, is sort of add in those calcium heavy products at reconstruction and then on a sort of drip feed program um, as we move through the year, just so that Basically, we're giving the nutrients every chance they need to be taken up by the plant. Um, we'll lose some, 
course, we'll lose some, um, but you know we're going to try and do everything, and we hope that that will um, will give us the results that we need, really. So I, I still want to sort of stay on the uh, management side of things. Um, during a season, what what is the time frame for a Premier League season? Because I've tried to comprehend it in the past, and there's just there's like one season, and then there's half the other season, and then champion season. I'm like, okay. I, I see soccer, you know, could you sort yeah. of explain uh, how long your season is uh, and how you are managing the pitch accordingly, if that makes sense? I apologize for not understanding. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. I wouldn't be able to tell you much about um, American football seasons and American football confuses me greatly. So I, I get it. It's fine. <laughs> it's all good. Not, it's not the best. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, so typically our football season will kick off in August. And in a nutshell, that season runs through till May. That's it. Starts in August, ends in May. Within that season, we might play. So in our in the Premier League, we play all of our games all the way from August through to May. But within that season, we have cup competitions that you're involved in. And as you progress, you just play those games as they come forward. So, you know, the Champions League, that will sort of start around sort of September time. And that will run through right until sort of this time of season where the Champions League, you know, and that's where you play teams in Europe. Um, will you know this is the best of the best in in a sense um and that will run through to around about now um and then you've got the FA cup and and local cup comp not local but um national cup competitions that all run through that season so typically we'll manage the pitch sort of as the seasons move with that you know we we will typically end the season in may and then the day after the last game we'll renovate the pitch completely and we'll reseed so we strip the pitches out completely, which I see moving a lot more around the States. Now, something that I think um, the guys over there weren't keen to do for a long time. And then all of a sudden, a few started making steps into Corrowin and then it just woof, it just took off. Um, and that's sort of been standard practice here for a number of years. And so we'll do that, um, obviously redress and seed. And then we have typically around about five or six weeks to establish the sword ready for the first game of the following season. So it's not long at all as a rule. Um, you know, we, we have little or no downtime. Uh, so, and then the season starts again in August or uh, well, friendlies will start in July. So it's a bit of a tight turnaround and, you know, we're growing, we're growing perennial ryegrass, um, which, you know, is very, very quick to establish, thankfully. Um, and it suits our climate really well. Um, and, uh, but, you know, at five and a half weeks old, it's always a little bit nerve wracking when they take the first step out as to what we're going to see. Um, to, so we're just hoping it's established well enough. But, you know, I think we've got it sort of there or thereabouts now. It's, it's, uh, we've been doing it for a little while. So, yeah. Uh, and that's that's something that I would I'm always nervous about, even just a normal. And you guys are going in five weeks. <laughs> so um, I was going to ask with sort of the climate in England, how does that again? You said it suits it well. Um, obviously. Usually. May into August is not the time frame when you're going to be, and again, maybe the climate's different there, but here and where we're at in the United States, we're in that transition zone where it's like super hot and having to manage that irrigation and all that. And you're just sort of giving it a little too much at the same time, making sure that everything is sort of healthy. Um, what is it that you're doing to sort of combat, say, again, maybe a hot summer slash a damp uh, time frame during the season. What are the different uh, practices that you're doing to ensure that you're having the safest uh, pitch possible for your players? So, so it sort of it does swing quite a lot because obviously you can imagine within a stadium environment, it's almost like a giant greenhouse. Um, you know, with it has its own microclimate. And I was talking about the stadium specifically because it's quite a unique environment in which to establish pitches. Really, um, you know, so in the height of summer. What we tend to do is, is at the point where we've seeded the pitches, uh, we'll spray a systemic fungicide on there because what we tend to find is that in the, the rapid heat of, of the summer, which, you know, maybe by your standards is nothing, but by our standards, you know, in England, we're just grateful to see the sun at least twice a year. Um, so, you know, we can, inside the stadium, we can reach temperature of about 40 degrees centigrade um, in the height of summer. And ryegrass just doesn't really like anything over... 32 33 degrees centigrade it just doesn't like it one bit so what we do to combat it say we will spray we use a lot of wetting agents as well when we when we, we coat the seed with the wetting agent and some of the biostimulants and also a systemic fungicide 
um, just to try and help it establish that a little bit quicker. Because obviously built on sand as well, sand warms up exceptionally quickly. Um, but we need the sand for what is winter sports, which is what we are. We're a winter sport. Um, so it, it sort of it, it gives us a really unique environment to bring the grass through. Last year, for the first time, we actually used germination covers um, to grow in the pitch. Um, and that was really successful. And we only use them for maybe the first four days. So we'll have germination in typically four or five days, just, just starting to germinate. And then we whip the covers off um, and let it start establishing itself. And then we also use um, some growth regulation products once it gets to second leaf stage, just to start strengthening the cell wall and start driving the root system down, um, which is a little bit risky, but it's calculated risk. Everything's calculated and, and, and sort of thought through. And uh, yeah, so that the summer growing is always the most worrying bit because we can go from extreme heat and humid and then all of a sudden the, the temperature will just drop and it, it just doesn't like it much at all. Um, and then within the stadium, those swings can be even more sort of vast, you know, so that's sort of like a typical summer growing. Um, and then we, we, we try not to run too much of a fungicide programme because, again, there's a lot of legislation over here coming in about the use of fungicides and the overuse of fungicides. So we try and use a lot more. Um, I think phosphites is a registered fungicide over in the States, but it's not here. So we use a lot of phosphites whilst we're getting away with it. It's technically a biostimulant. Um, and uh, we use a lot of those to try and combat the, the pressures of disease that sit within the stadium. And then as we move through into the uh, as we move through into the winter, you know, obviously we have a lot of issues it's always wet in England, as you're probably all fully aware of. It's very, very wet over here most of the time. And that's where the sand based pitch comes into its own. Um, and it's about keeping the leaf dry. You know, and and also within a stadium, and I, I noticed that you'd maybe on the questions there, you'd spoke to Carl, and he's right. It's like growing grass in a shoebox. It is, it's it's terrible. So in October we'll deploy our lighting rigs. Uh, we've got a third of a pitch of of lighting rigs, um, and that that delivers the just about the right micromoles of light to ensure that the plant can still photosynthesize and recover. And again, sort of focusing on that recovery through the winter becomes even more important with our biostimulant program. That after the games that we're recovering it really quickly because the plant isn't doing it for itself um, and also through the um, winter months what we'll do is we'll run our undersoil heating in and around 12 degrees centigrade in the soil so that the plant is always active it never goes dormant in which case it can recover um, so that's sort of how we move through the seasons we don't use any different grasses we don't transition like you guys maybe would um, from a Bermuda to a ryegrass or anything like that. We don't do any of that. It is ryegrass all year round. Um, but as as we are seeing the temperatures creep up in the summer, that's becoming more and more difficult um, only because the ryegrass just doesn't like the heat, as I'm sure you're fully aware of. But yeah, and then again, we move back into the spring and summer and, you know, it's, uh, it's about, we've created an artificial environment within the stadium. We want the pressure that we're under in the Premier League, the pressure that we're under as a, as a club and as a department, is that when the players walk out in December on December the 26th to play a game, they want it to look like it does in August. That's because they want absolute pristine all year round. And any less than that, we find out very quickly <laughs> that that's <laughs> you know. Oh, they always have something to say, right? <laughs> they're all ag they're all agronomists. I found all of them. Every single one, right? Yeah. That that one yeah. leaf blade is taller. What's going on there? <laughs> and it is it is just like that and uh you know there's a there's a lot of um there's a lot of banter in football um but they say it with a bit of uh, tongue in cheek and i think that they 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 know that we'll they'll will nibble at them if they if they tell us it's not quite right so <laughs> but the expectations are high and that's why you know we, we all put ourselves under a lot of pressure we all put, we're in the spotlight you know watched by you know millions if not billions of people across the world week in week out so it was a it's just constant pressure. It's just a, a cauldron, really, of pressure all the time for me and the staff. So, well, you definitely rise up to the occasion. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. If we're just talking about seeing it on the TV, it's gorgeous all the time. Thank um, you. What other practices you've talked about? Fertilization. You talked about fungicides. Um, with the uh, artificial lighting, like you said, you kind of answered that question already, but. Um, what other practices are you aerating at all? Are you uh, verticutting? cutting? Is there anything that you're doing? Uh, and obviously with ryegrass, there's a lot less necessity in certain areas like us with Bermuda grass. We have to be verticutting cutting and constantly just because of, again, those rhizomes and stolons. 
What is it that you're doing to ensure that, again, I mean, you have high traffic in the goalie boxes, you have high traffic in uh, your side lines with the mm-hmm. annoying refs that caused all the pretty <laughs> stripes to go away. Dang it. <laughs> um, <laughs> what are you doing to ensure that you have the that playability that's consistent that they, again, expect because they're the professionals and we're not, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we focus really heavily on on player interaction with the surface. So for, for me personally, a lot of our, our remit is about turf hygiene, as we call it, like probably you guys would with in terms of, you know, we do do a lot of vertical and we do a lot of grooming um, throughout the season. We have to be careful, obviously, with it being um, the plant sort of naturally wanting to go dormant through the winter. We have to be very careful as we move into the winter, just how much we do. Um, but we, we use um, a uni rate quite a lot. And we've seen one of them campies. We, we use them a lot in the growing season and we also use them a lot through the spring because what we're looking for really is the, is the players stood to make contact with the soil and not with any layer of thatch or buildup. Um, and, and what we found is as, as the pitches got older and um, the synthetic fibres that are stitched, now when they're stitched, they're like this. So they're stitched in and they stand up really rigid. But when they get to 10 years old, the, the, the molecular structure of that plastic starts to fold. So it, ca- it causes a canopy at the bottom of the plant. And what happens there is any of the debris sticks that canopy um, and then that stops the player penetrating through into the soil. And that's why we tend to see a lot of the issues around um, when players are slipping. It's like my worst nightmare is players slipping, especially if they're going through on goal, especially if they're about to take a penalty, you know, because because the serious amount of money that's involved in the game, you know, if we've got one of our players stepping up to take a penalty in the last minute of the last game of the season, then it means that we can finish in the Champions League or we finish a place lower. That can cost a club £40 million in one kick. So for me, hygiene is really key. So all those good cultural practices with keeping the sward clean, keeping it healthy, um, reducing that dieback that sits at the base of the plant is is absolutely imperative to um, producing that surface, not just aesthetically and plant health for the players who we're we're here to service the players that's what we're here we're here to facilitate the players that's what we're doing but we want to make sure that it's safe we want to make sure that it it can allow them to achieve their potential if you if you want to say that and we test we run loads of tests on the pitches you know we test for um traction we test how firm it is we've got a a field tester that measures energy restitution stud deformation we've you know we've got how green we've got an ndvi meter which tests how green it is and we're doing that three times a week um, and we feed those results into sports science so that they can then interact with the players and, and sort of let them know what to expect so for example we'll know that if the pitch is at a certain firmness and if we're getting a certain amount of energy restitution our star player jamie vardy can hit his top load because we know that he likes it at a certain parameter to make sure he gets the best performance so we do a lot of that and a lot of that comes down to hygiene and plant health and our cultural practices um, and aeration with manipulating how firm or how soft it is with aeration um, you know and we do aerate on a program basis once a month um, and we vary the times we use a toro pro core we absolutely love that machine they're absolutely fantastic probably one of my favorite machines um, and uh, you know but if we get to a point where we're getting near a game we can manipulate the surface down to, make, to soften it up if it's if it's gone too far um, but because we monitor it so closely we don't tend to get to a point where we have to take any drastic action um, but we've got that in the locker should we need it so yeah lots of cultural practices and almost well they are just as important as all the you know the chemical and fertilizer inputs and plant health bits it's the cultural stuff is so important I love how you bring it all back to science and sort of how all this sort of uh, develops. And honestly, with talking to so many professionals and uh, being a different, I've worked in professional baseball and football. You are way more science-based than a lot of people I've actually had discussions with about it. And it's incredible to see how you're taking not just the the science aspect, but again, the whole uh, athlete aspect, you know, a lot of, a lot of places aren't able to have that sort of interaction and really make, have, really have that big impact on the game so i think that's incredible um thank you i mean one thing that i'll say to and it's something that i i talk about a lot within the club is is that if you look at whether it's a soccer player or it's an american football player they are the most valuable asset to any club in terms of monetary value and and those guys are training and performing on what we're producing 
So we have a duty of care to those to, to give them the best possible surface. Now, if the two aren't talking to each other, then how are we ever going to support each other? You know, if we can educate them in, in what we're doing, that's going to benefit them. Um, you know, we can see great feedback from them and we can actually go to get feedback and not see it as criticism. If they come and say, you know, it's at my legs, it was a bit heavy today. You know, we'll look to change that because we want them to perform because if they perform, then we all reap the benefits of that. So it's really important when I explain to the board and when I explain, you know, to anyone to get that level of investment or to understand what we're doing is to, to revert it back to the players because that's what we're here to facilitate them. And like I've said before, and they are the most valuable asset. You know, our squad is worth, well, finger in the air, 500 million pounds. You know, and we're and they're using our surfaces. <laughs> so how important is that? We've got to take that seriously and we've got to be accountable for it. And if we hide under a rock, and, and just think, well, that's what we've always done. That's what we've always done. That's fine. It's fine. We're great. You'll never learn. You'll never move on. And you'll never interact with the people that actually can help you make a difference. So I find that it's been such a valuable le learning curve for me to be on at the club is to engage with sports science, engage with the players, and then talk them around to show them that we're there to look after them, really. We're there to help them, not hinder them. Absolutely. Uh one of my former bosses, we're actually going to have him on next week, but he used to say the uh, the grounds crew was uh, responsible for at least three wins a season uh, or four wins a season. This is baseball, but there's 162 of those. But again, the role that you guys play and the role that all of us play is way bigger than anyone actually believes. So I think that's incredible. Um yeah. And, and the way, and like you said, the way you can manipulate, I remember talking to him, he's like, well, if there's a fast runner, I can water the infield down so that he's slower, you know, different things like that. And the other big thing is I really appreciate you bringing up the impact of money that we turf grass managers have, you know, um, I worked for the Mets the year that they went to the world series, the money that comes in just from the extra, like one or two games, let alone going to the championship game is I would say close to a billion dollars in the end. Wow. It's, it's insane. Um, so I do, I really appreciate you bringing that up. It's really great. Um, the next thing I want to sort of get into, again, you said you sort of been doing this for 20 years now in the industry. Um, what sort of technological advances advancements have you seen and have you sort of uh, adopted for uses? You were just talking about you're monitoring the, the grass on a, Pri weekly basis, if that's a word, even <laughs> three times a week. I'll take it. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're monitoring it three times a week. Hey, it's what we do here, you know, new thing. <laughs> um, monitoring it in different ways and making sure and ensuring that that science is sound. Is there any really big one that has stuck out to you over the years that you have seen and continue to see development in? Um, and is there any like new technology that you've seen in the last couple of years that you might want to adopt with the new pitch that's coming in? Yeah, I mean, obviously for me, um, the, the big thing has been the testing that we do. Um, and we don't just test um, the stadium, we test all of our training fields as well um, on a daily basis. And all those results are fed back into sports science so that we're trying to get that sort of parity between what they're training on, what they're playing on and on a match day. Um, and also we, we test our women's facility. So the women have never had that sort of interaction with the grounds team before. Um, because the women's game is emerging really fastly over here in the UK. It's, it's uh, finally catching up with some of the parts of the world. Um, and, you know, we, we're at the forefront of that as well in terms of testing with them. So the testing has been a really, really big one for me. Um, the lighting rigs, obviously, you may have seen sort of like our, you know, our um, grow lights that you, from SGL that, that we put on the pitch. You know, they've been a revolution really in terms of, allowing us to produce the standards that we need to produce in the depths of winter you know but what we're sort of excited about is there's a bit of an emergence in the led market um you know and it, for us over here we need we need the heat which comes off the hps lamps that we, we run at the minute um so we get a lot of heat off them and we don't get a lot of heat off led or no heat off led so you do have to compensate that with um with infrared heat so with, with lamps that are attached to the to the LED units, which make them sort of balance on an energy efficiency sort of platform, if you want to call it that. And um, but what would excite me, and certainly if I was a maybe a warm season grass or turf manager, is the use of LEDs in growing pitches in when the climate is warm, right? 
because you know what what the plant needs is it needs the heat and the light um, and if you're getting the heat naturally and you can get the light through an LED source then all of a sudden that becomes a real winner in terms of sustainability and you know not burning tons and tons of carbon into the atmosphere so that's the one we're watching with interest at the minute we've got a, we're what we what we are here at Leicester and something the culture that I've tried to create here is is that you know I want people with new products and technologies to come to us I want us to trial them give them some critique rip it apart if you want to call it that we've done that a couple of times but only to help them make it better you know we we, we had the same conversation I don't know whether you've seen uh, the Cub Cadet mowers the Infini Cup mowers the yellow ones that we you know we, we were one of the first people to have the prototype of that and, and we tore it to shreds we absolutely tore it to shreds and we told them where they needed to be and what they needed to do to get it into the market and you know we like to feel that we played a little part of that emerging um, into the market and we love doing that so anything that's new and advanced in terms of technology we, we welcome that in we will look at it and we'll give them some sort of thorough feedback if you want to and maybe a little bit harsh sometimes um, but only for them to be better and to better us as an industry but Certainly, yeah, the, the test and the LED are the two things that are really sort of the big movement. Um, the rest of the stuff has sort of always been there, always been there. But the practices that we're all um, sort of invoking now are the things that are bringing that technology forward and, and helping us improve the standards. You know, so I think that's probably, you know, those two are probably the, the two that I'd focus on in the short term anyway for now. For sure. And again, I think it's incredible how you're doing. Uh, you're working with the Infinity. I know there's a few people over here that are using them now, uh, even the MLB uh, that are using them. Um, do you have any partnerships with anyone in the industry specific to Leicester City that you work for? Um, do, have you had other opportunities to do things like that where you, again, are not the test dummy, but say, hey, we're going to put it through the ringer and we're going to let you know if your product can make it, you know, like, and I think that's huge. And for the fact that you were able to do that, has there ever been any other opportunity, whether it's a uh, chemical product or anything else? Um, machine yeah. wise? Well, it's so it's uh, yeah, it's like I said, it's something that we've always done and we don't, we try not to engage in partnerships only for the fact that partnership, that word at this football club, carries a big cost. <laughs> Do you want to be a partner of the football club? People pay a lot of money for that. So we try and avoid that sort of terminology. But, you know, we, um, for example, I'll give you one example. When we, we've just invested a lot of money at the new training facility and a whole new fleet of equipment. Um, and we ended up going with John Deere predominantly, um, apart from Toro Pro Cores, which were the only thing that I stipulated that we must have. Um, and uh, we also... We, we actually might be getting one in a couple of weeks. So I'm very yeah. excited. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all sort of bits of kit awesome bits of kit and um we also had the infinity cut mowers but what we did is we set up a trial so we we basically invited everyone every manufacturer to the market we top they dropped all their kit off at our old training ground and we had our staff run those machines um on all of our pitches see how they turn see how they move see how easy it was to take the grass box off we had our mechanics strip them down and put them back together and then all of our staff collated the feedback form for each piece of equipment which we fed into the manufacturers but then that also helped us base our decision on whether it was green or whether it was red, um, you know, or whether we were going to go with someone else. Um, so, you know, that sort of those sort of things is just stuff that we love doing. It gives our staff experience. So all my guys have had now got experience on whether it's Baroness, whether it's Toro, whether it's John Deere, whether it's anyone else. We've had them around the table. Um, and also, you know, we've used their feedback to form our decisions because they're the guys that are using it, not me. I, I, I can make the decisions and I can make things happen and I can get money signed off, but I'm not the one really sat on the mower that often. So it's really important that they feel comfortable with what they're doing and, and what they're working with. So, yeah, we, we welcome anybody. Um, and in terms of, you know, I know we'll probably touch on the Sports Surf Academy um, shortly, but, you know, one of our, our pillars of the business plan that, that sits around the Turf Academy trials and research um and we they're the uk probably is screaming out for a truly independent research center and that's our aspiration to be that truly independent research center so we will new products that are emerging through the market we are bringing in we're testing in our laboratory we're using our trial plots to uh to to um quantify all the data that they they claim to have um and also we've just um secured some glass house space at a local college uh, where we're going to be running glass house trials and i've seen you guys have got a new glass house that's really impressive um and uh, yeah and uh, that was something that we as we're aspiring to have that um but yeah 
it's, it's part of our mantra. It's part of what we want to do. We want to we want to inform the industry, and you know, by bringing products in and testing them, you know, scrutinising them, and then spewing them out the other end. We hopefully can sort of separate the wheat from the chaff, right? <laughs> um, and it, I believe what you're doing is absolutely incredible. By sort of, and it's what I aim to do with this program of how you're empowering your staff and how you're allowing them to be a part of that decision-making process. Yeah. Um, I know with our kids, like we try and do different things, like whether it's the paint scheme for a football game or something, or allowing them to put the mowing pattern, which again, you have inspired a lot of mowing patterns. I just want to let you know over here. Um, so with all that, I'm very grateful for that. And I think that is absolutely incredible. And that's how we're going to have more and more people come to this incredible industry you know um yeah. so we can get into this now because i am so excited to talk about this uh you probably have created one of the greatest facilities to i mean on earth if i'm being honest <laughs> with your practice facility. Pretty impressive. Yeah. i've watched a couple videos and i'm just like whoa okay yeah. um could you sort of walk us through what the i believe it's called seed grave training See, grave, yeah, yeah okay so yeah, could you sort cool. of just walk through the comp i mean it's it's so big let's talk about that yeah. for a second could you just sort of discuss the different aspects of what you have done and what has gone into it and how much of a role you played in because from what i've read and seen you played one of the biggest roles out of anyone in the organization so you could yeah. sort of just discuss what that process was like from when you started and how you are here now with your full complex yeah, so I mean, this process started in and around about four years ago. Um, when I first joined the club, there was a lot of talk around um, new training facility, new training facility. It was something that really attracted me to the role and attracted me to to stay at the club and and be part of something because I knew when we did it, we'd do it properly and we'd do it well. Um, and really, we spent we probably spent the first year really sort of visiting other people's training facilities. So we visited a lot of the facilities in the UK, like Spurs, uh, Tottenham Hotspur amazing facility unbelievable facility um manchester city we looked at theirs and we looked at some some others as well that you know maybe we could um learn some from their mistakes if you want to call it that and we had um you know we spoke to a lot of the guys that built these places and said you know what would you have done differently how would you have done it better um and we used all that feedback to sort of formulate our own training ground and people will come and learn from us there's things that we could have done better potentially um, and, you know, hopefully people will come to us in the coming years and make things better because that's progress. But I was really, really fortunate to be part of that process from literally inception, um, from a piece of paper, from driving around Leicestershire trying to find land, <laughs> you know, and that's hard to come by. Uh, that scale of land is hard to come by. Um, and we actually had uh, purchased, a, well, put a, an agreement in place to buy a golf course in Leicester. And then that all fell through at the last minute, but we'd already invested, you know, quite a lot of money into designing that facility. Um, so we took the core principles of that disappointment and we moved them on to, we found Seagrave and uh, we purchased that. It's 181 acres, which is seven and a half times the size of what we were currently operating on. Um, it was a nine, 18 hole golf course. Um, so it was an existing golf course. And we basically um, developed that. We developed the, the program and the, the work and the pattern of work and, and all the scope of the contract um, again probably took us about six to eight months on top of the work we'd already done to get to a point where we actually were going to put a digger in the ground and so I'd had a you know a really I've re had really heavy involvement been on the project board you know and I was the only only person on that board that wasn't a director at the football club so I felt really fortunate to be in that company and to see that process and Although I'm sports turf and very, very focused on sports turf, man, I learned so much about process and legalities and contracts and subcontractors and con building contracts. And, you know, I felt really fortunate. And a lot of the times I would sit back and listen and just take it all in. Um, but as I said to the board at the time, you know, 95% of that footprint is going to be managed by myself and my staff. It's really, really important that I'm part of this process and, and involved from day one. Because a lot of the time, it's a lot of focus around the building and how beautiful the building can be and how amazing that can be. And often, sometimes, sports turf is forgotten about. So, um, yeah, really fortunate. And, and we went through weekly project board meetings. We were, you know, sort of five or six hours of really sort of hard-hitting, lots of contractual um, design meetings. And, 
it was and that didn't let up with the minute we put a spade in the ground it only ramped up one way and I was you know I was present at that training ground for more times than I care to remember through the process of the two-year build um, but I'm really fortunate I've got a, a really good team around me and my, I put my number two up there on a daily basis so he sat and he I wanted to give him that experience of seeing something because this we're never we're potentially never going to do this again you know my career this might be a once in a lifetime opportunity and for me it was about engaging all the staff with that process from the very first moment right through to completion um so i put my number two in there and he sat in there and he was involved in all the meetings with me and it was a really great learning experience for him and for me um we had the staff up to inspire them to show them what we're doing and to to get them on board um all the way through the process at least sort of five or six times over the course of two years we'd bring all the staff of which there were a lot um, up to site, walk around, show them where they'd be working, show them the buildings going up, show them the sports the turf academy been built. Um, and uh, yeah, it, you know, we fast forward sort of you know, two years from when we put, first put a spade in the ground. Um, we opened the doors in December this like, last year. Um, and yeah, it, it's just been a whirlwind. And, you know, I probably took a breather throughout that two years uh, for about five minutes. And then I thought, right, we've got to run it now. You know, so... In the background of all that, you know, we were putting the staff together, the machinery tender together. Um, I was balancing the contractors and the pitch builds, and we were signing off all the stage of the pitch builds. We didn't, um, we didn't appoint an external consultant. We did it all ourselves because I wanted full control of that, just so that I knew what was happening. Um, and plus, you pay these consultants far too much money to do the job that you could do. So I sort of you know, saved the club a fortune in that sense. Um, Hopefully they paid you a little bit for it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. It's part of the remit, right? <laughs> it's in the um, job description, okay? We, we're just yeah, adding it. Yeah, yeah, they adapted the job description to put that in. Um, but, you know, no, it was, it was great for us, to, for us to see and be part of. And, you know, like I said, I, I sort of brought the team along for that journey with me, which was really important because, you know, this, again, it's something that we maybe are never going to get the chance to do in our careers again. Um, and yeah, you know, it was, uh, we moved in in December. We've been in there now for five months. Um, COVID's been a bit of a pain um, because we've only got the first team there training at the minute. But, you know, we, we're now in a rhythm. So we, bear in mind when I walked in the door um, seven years ago, we, I had six staff across two sites. Um, as of today, we've got 52 staff across three sites. So, you know, it's just, we've grown exponentially. So all, all the mechanisms that sit behind this thing that you see, that's been a really important part of my job is building all that in the background, ready for when we hit the button and when we take over and having all that stuff in place and all the, you know, the resource in place to make sure we can do the job once we get the keys. That, that number is incredible from six to 52. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Could you sort of speak, like you said, it's seven times as large. Is that correct? Is that what you said? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, how much land are you taking care of? Uh, sports for sports turf specific. Apologize, can't talk. Yes, yeah, fine. Uh, and then grounds. I believe there is grass on the roof of the building. Am I wrong saying that? <laughs> it it was going to be natural, but it's artificial. Okay, cause... I was just checking because I <laughs> I was thinking about the mower going up and just over, you know. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that formed part of the decision because we were we were talking about that and uh, we went to I don't know if any of you guys have been to the GMA Soltech show, but. We were there, it's where all the companies demonstrate their machinery and the seminars and there's educational pieces and the rest of it. And we went specifically to try and search for a mower that could mow the roof. Um, and we're talking away, and I won't mention the company because it's not fair, um, but we were on the stand and they had this robotic mower on a slant like that and it was roaming up and down and round and round and it looked great. Um, and we were talking to the rep and then it fell off. <laughs> so I was like, well, I don't, I don't know how that happened. That <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good choice, right? It's not a good choice to. Uh, yeah. The player comes out, boom, oh, boom, yeah, shut his head. Yeah, exactly. So, at that point, I fed that back in and sort of said I wasn't confident, and there's a lot of health and safety issues. So we end up making that synthetic. But in terms of the facility itself, it sits on 181 acres, and we have 21 sort of football pitches on natural football pitches on site. Um, there's a full-size synthetic indoor pitch, which is that beautiful dome that you see on some of the graphics, if you've seen them. Um, another outdoor synthetic pitch and two smaller synthetics as well. So there's a blend, but there's only sort of two and a half synthetics versus 21 natural grass pitches. 
Uh, we've also got a nine hole golf course on site. So we can retain some of the holes that were there. So that, that's good. That's been another sort of feather in the cap for John to learn about how to be a greenkeeper. Um, how, that, how is that going? Taking yeah, care of all that. It's you know? interesting. It's interesting. Uh, it's crazy. We've, we've employed a good course manager, a really good course manager, and he's teaching me, which I love. You know, I love learning new stuff. And, you know, we're also imparting some of our football methodology onto him in greenkeeping. And he's in turn bringing that back to us and it's been a really interesting learning curve and one that I'm really enjoying. So that's been good. Um, we've got the equivalent of seven football fields worth of landscape lawns across site on top of the pitches. Um, we've got, um, we've got areas of ecological interest. We've got about three hectares worth of ecological interest, which is a really important part of, of the remit for us. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a massive, massive site um, and we need all the staff that we've got to, to look after it to the standard that is expected. So, you know, we've, uh, yeah, we've been lucky, but we're, uh, we're also very, very busy. I, seven times as big with the golf course and everything, I can say it's probably <laughs> quadruple as busy, you know? So yeah, uh, yeah. with that, you were sort of talking about the ecological interest. Could you sort of talk to the unique characteristics? Uh, I believe I read something about the irrigation system and how you guys are retaining everything and reusing the water. And then uh, a couple more things uh, like wildlife. And what what was that sort of environmental approach and how did that become such a big part of sort of this construction, especially over just two years, having that ecological mind in, in a sense, was that you? Were there other people that were uh, interested in doing something along those lines? What was sort of that decision-making process for the club? So a lot of a lot of it. I mean, there's an there's an element of of responsibility and and sort of ethics involved in a lot of these things, sustainability and ecology and all the rest of it. Um, you know, but we because we were taking on a site that you know had a lot of of ecological habitat in you know in, embedded in it already, and we were basically putting a bulldozer straight through the middle of it. Yeah, a lot of that ecological thought process had to happen as a matter of protecting the environment and protecting the habitats that had formed there, you know, because it'd be like someone coming and bulldozing your house and not consulting you on it. You'd want someone to give you a little bit of thought and a cuddle, right, to say, oh, it'll be okay and we're going to put you somewhere else. <laughs> um, so, yeah, exactly. So what we sort of did is we, we compensated for the areas that we pretty much ransacked um, and we developed all those areas ahead of the development. So... It was a real sort of well thought out process well ahead of time where we would we were creating additional habitats for newts. We were creating additional habitats for the birds and um, we were planting, you know, seven times the amount of trees that we were removing um, all those things to try and create that diversity across the site to allow those species to migrate and then have a habitat to live in. Um, so there was, a, there was a period of, of newt monitoring. So there was uh, there was guys out there literally monitoring and counting newts, which was a a big job um, and also you know a lot of a lot of it revolves around a lot of planning consent so we actually needed to do this as part of a planning consent that's why it forms such a big part of what we do now because we've got um, what's called a land ecology and management plan that if we don't adhere to it they could shut the site down it's as simple as that because we can't just go mowing through newts and we can't just go you know chopping trees down willy-nilly um, because it all has an impact and we all have to be mindful to that and is that thought formed a really big part of that? And we've got our sort of gardens and landscape manager who's got a really um, detailed background in uh, ecology. So we lean on him a lot to manage that process for us. Uh, ultimately, I'm accountable. So if he sort of decides to take it upon himself to, you know, uproot a, a, a habitat of newts or chop a load of trees down, I'm the one that will get the sack, not him. But, you know, we have to be so, so mindful to, to the environment that these these sort of bugs and and uh, wildlife live in, and I think we've done really well. Actually, we've 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 gone above and beyond, um, and we're really committed to it. It's not something that's just a tick box for us. It's really important, and all the like the attenuation ponds that we talked about that hold the water and discharge it at a very sensible rate. Um, you know, we've we've made wildlife ponds for all the local habitats, and the golf course hosts a lot of that. So whilst the golf course is practical, it's also most of the habitat for all that ecology so it's um it's almost like a bit of a nature trail and a golf course at the same time it's pretty cool that is really cool uh we have a, a local well high school in our county uh they built a nature 
trail between the elementary school and the high school. So that's sort of their connection and how they can work uh, with students at different age groups. So that's definitely a really great uh, aspect to have there. Um, with your sort of, you obviously, you said 52 now, what is it that uh, you're doing on site at the uh, Seagrave complex that somewhat differs from King power and has changed in a sense of from what used to be at the old facility. That's now the woman's facility. Um, whether it's again, I know probably you're using, you were using the infinity cut uh, mowers. Are you using riding mowers since there's 21 fields? <laughs> are, you doing, are they walking all those? Cause if I was walking all those, I wouldn't be alive. So what is it that you're doing that's uh, different and how has that sort of uh, been developed in the plan of when this started five months ago? Yeah, I mean, we've, um, again, we developed, it comes from a bit of a time management plan, really, and sort of looking at the model that we were running at, at our old training ground, which where everything was hand mown, everything from, from line to line and everything outside of it. We, we hardly ever used any ride on equipment there, but given not just the, the time scales in terms of turning pitches around for training and for games and all the rest of it. It's about the ma managing all the staff because across those staff, we've got, we have to accommodate a thousand holiday days a year <laughs> to give you an example, um, you know, across the 52 staff. And then, so there's actually at least sort of, you know, three days a week, every week of the year where people are off. It's, you know, so we have to balance that. And we had to then look at how we, can we sustain that sort of walking model if you want. And don't get me wrong, you know, our staff are covering some serious mileage still because a lot of the areas we are hand mowing at the minute, all the first team areas. Um, and what we tend to do is we've adapted to some of the ride on equipment and um, onto the academy areas um, because they're not being used at the minute either. So um, it's a case of just trying to be as efficient as possible um, until the academy turn up because obviously because of COVID, we've had a bit of a lockdown at our Seagrave training facility. So, um, so yeah, we had to sort of adapt our thought process, but without losing the quality. And that's why those trials and the equipment were so important to try and give us the quality that a hand mower would give us and put it into a, you know, a cylinder mower that's a triple mower or a five gang mower or whatever. So that's been important, but as and where we can, you know, our staff will be walking 35, 36,000 steps a day. Um, you know, it's, it's a colossal site and, and, We've got standards and that's and i think you get great standards from walking <laughs> and the staff may disagree and they may hate me for it but you know <laughs> they can see the results and uh i think also you know when you're i always find that when i'm sort of mowing a pitch and especially when i'm walking my eyes are always looking i'm sort of always looking down and when you're on a bigger mower you can't tend to see as much so it's you know for me it sort of gives us the, the, the eyes on the ground as well by walking behind machinery but you know like i said we're not adverse to uh, ride on equipment and we have got a lot of it now um, but where we can the preference is always to hand cut so that's sort of been the biggest swing in what we've had to do from a mechanical point of view um, and you know it, we're still getting the same results but we try and preference walking where we can absolutely um i am be honest i would probably i don't i don't know if my kids would come back to class if i made them walk yeah. the whole field i be <laughs> honest with you um, but, um, probably the best part of the new facility, um, is the sports turf Academy. Um, and I, I remember reading an article, oh man, I think it was two years ago that they announced it sort of, is that correct? Am I, am yeah, I it would have been, yeah. So when it, when they announced, it, I was like, wow, that's probably one of the coolest things you can do as an organization is to a recognize what you're doing as the the sports turf manager and b investing in that and providing sort of that opportunity could you sort of speak to how you even were able to make this happen and what the program is specifically and sort of how that has become a major part of what the uh club is about yeah well so it all sort of it all began um at my time when i was at coventry city uh, we had a situation where the football club left the stadium um and i found myself with a lot of time on my hands <laughs> and uh i i sort of because on my mind's always active and i'm always looking to try and develop things um, i've come up with this concept of building a, a sports surf academy now you know what you guys do over there is, is phenomenal really to have you know that sort of this sort of industry is part of a syllabus and part of a program is something that just doesn't happen here 
it just doesn't happen. And I thought that, you know, for me, our industry needed that centralised hub to bring it all together because the GMA couldn't do it because they're a not-for-profit organisation and this was going to be an expensive venture. Um, so I've set about writing a business plan for this sort of sports surf academy um, and sort of did all the finances and quickly realised it was going to take about sort of 18 to 20 million pounds to get it off the ground by once we built fields and built buildings and found land and all the rest of it. So I sort of shuffled it into a, a folder and left it there. Um, then I joined Leicester City and, um, you know, when we started talking about a new training round, I approached the chief executive and said to her, look, I'm going to sell you a piece of my soul here. Um, this is something that I want to do. This is something that I think would fit really well with the club's mentality and what we've achieved. And at that point, we were like the patterns were in and we were at the forefront of the industry and people were looking at us as trailblazers and all that sort of stuff. So he took it to the ownership. And I remember quite sort of distinctively, I was, I was actually in Belgium because we've got a club in Belgium in Europe. Um, and I was over there and she was in Thailand, the chief exec was in Thailand with the owners and she rang me and it was like three in the morning or something, it's a time difference. And uh, she said they want to do it. And I remember just literally jumping out of bed and sort of parading myself around the, this hotel room sort of in absolute joy that they bought into my concept. Um, and from there, it just formed part of the fabric of building this training ground. Um, you know, and with a real sort of drive and ambition from me to centralise the talent and bring new talent through and inform the industry in the best way and be properly impartial and independent when it comes to that sort of data collection and trials and research. Um, and, you know, the first part of it was building the building and the building that you may have seen pictures of now, which is, you know, is quite the statement. Um, and again, not, I don't want to sort of band figures around and it's not a bravado thing, but you know, the club invested £3.2 million in that building alone for me. And that makes me shiver every time I talk about it because, you know, it, it was from a, a concept, a business idea, or something that they believed in me. And, that, and even wherever I go in the future, even if I'm still at Leicester in 20 years time, I'll be forever grateful for that sort of belief in me and what we're doing. Um, so very, very quickly, fast forward 18 months and the building is, is now open. Um, but, but unfortunately for us, COVID hit and it's hampered our, our official launch, if you want to call it that. Um, so we're officially due to launch in July um, and that's where we'll open the doors to start rolling out our programme. So I'll sort of give you the, the breakdown of the four pillars that we sit on as a business plan. Um, the first one being education and training at the forefront. It always every other pillar wraps around to education and training in whatever form. And what we want to do is we want to take anybody from a one day course right through to a doctorate or a PhD um, and train them at our facility because we've got the capability to do that. Um, we've employed a doctor of sports turf, uh, Jonathan Knowles, who's our sports turf academy manager. Um, he's got a doctorate uh, in sports turf and he was part of uh, a college, MySco College, you may have heard of it, you may not. In the UK, it's sort of one of the leading uh, colleges in, in the UK for sports turf. And um, he's our sports turf academy manager, so we brought him on board. He's got a great educational background. He's also got a great trials and research background as well. Um, so training education, like I say, we want to take the syllabus and put it on acid, basically. So if you come to us and want to do a level two, a degree, a six week course, uh, you know, an internship, whatever you want to call it, um, we will take the syllabus and we will blow it up and add loads of value into your learning experience. So we'll, we've engaged with local uh, universities to supply some sports biomechanics. So we're looking at the player interaction. We've looked at a business college and we're working with them on delivering some business skills. So if some of the staff have aspirations to be in management, we'll run a management programme for them. Um, and there's a lot of bespoke courses going on. So like if you guys come to us and said, we want our guys to get some experience in whatever it might be, ryegrass, natural pitches, hybrid pitches, management, excellence, whatever you want to be. We're, we've got the facility and the capability to write any course we want, which is what we're going to sell ourselves on. Um, so the education piece is really sort of diverse and, and important to us. Um, the second pillar is the trials and research. So we have a fully spec laboratory in the building. We have Jonathan, who's a doctor, um, and we're going to use our PhD students to run those trials for us. Um, so we're going to welcome the industry into the into the business and, uh, you know, test their products, test them, 
for you know whatever it might be with it machine be it a chemical be it a fertilizer and, and give them some real valid impartial data rather than some of the pseudoscience that does happen a lot in the industry um, the third pillar is um, tournament support so across the globe there is a massive demand for well skilled trained staff to facilitate tournaments you probably know over there like the golf big golf tournaments you you go over and you help out and you provide labor um and it's the same here but we're we're reaching across the world with this um you know we want to we want to be in every country providing sports turf talent into areas because what it will do is it gives our students an avenue to exit from our program so anyone that's on the program will come through and we can't give them a job they can't everyone can't have a job at leicester city because we just don't we've already got 52 so i right, don't want to end up with like 152 um, or a thousand you know <laughs> or, yeah well you know um because the way i see it is that a lot around legacy and a lot around giving those the people that come through the system i want them to be a legacy for for us for the club for the sports turf academy but i want them to be really sort of at the top of their game so anyone that comes into us i want them to leave in a better place and i want to give them the opportunities across the globe to work in this fantastic industry be it over there in the states be it in australia be it in you know africa wherever we want to offer those opportunities and working with bodies like FIFA, UEFA, um, Wimbledon tennis, you know, we've got some links into Wimbledon. We're, we're obviously been wrapped in with John Deere with the equipment, you know, working the John Deere classic, sending some of the, the students to the States, but also welcoming people over here to, to run the program and maybe find opportunity in the UK. So we sort of want to become that hub, but through the tournament support, it's about offering the industry some resource, some skilled resource, but it's also about the resource offering our staff an exit strategy to find a job because that's, that's the whole point right so yeah and then the final one is our sports turf academy technical services so this is a, a really i love this piece of work that we've done here so this this pillar it we go into the local community um, all the grassroots pitches and we improve their pitches by sending our expertise out to, to do the work on those areas so we'll go out into the local club and we will send our staff, our machinery, our expertise, products, and we'll go and improve those pitches. And there's a big um, drive from the Football Association, the Premier League, um, to improve grassroots facilities across the county. Um, and our ambition, there's 4,000 pitches um, or fields across the county that need improving. And uh, for us, we want to be part of that improvement. And we're the only Premier League club to, to do that to offer that level of input um, so, and also it gives our staff a bit of perspective because a lot of our young staff have come in and all they've seen is sea grape <laughs> so you can imagine they're really well conditioned to really nice things and lots of equipment and lots of mechanics that fix all their gear and i want them to go and see the dog and duck local football club you know that needs you know they haven't got a, you know any money or any resource and see the real world so i can also give the students that blend of of perspective as well as anything else and ultimately sort of like the overall goal is to is to produce some excellent people and produce some staff that can feed the industry and you know represent us and represent themselves in the best way and you know take the industry to the next level or over and above what i can even take it to you know and be the future of, of what we're trying to produce here so that's in a nutshell because i could go on for about two days and i won't but um in a nutshell that's the premise of what we're what we're doing and all based at Seagrave, which is an unbelievable place to learn your trade. Well, I could definitely listen to it for two days. <laughs> That's absolutely probably one of the most incredible things I've ever heard about anything sports turf. You're you're pretty much making a college, is what you're saying, yeah. correct? Okay. I say, I mean, that's the thing is, you know, like what you guys have got there, we don't have that here. We just don't have it. If you want to study sports turf, there is probably maybe two or three colleges in the whole country that you can go to to study and you have to make that choice that isn't a choice that's even exposed to you in school or you know, in, in a high school it's that's just not exposed it's not a career choice it's not something that people go oh i'd like to go into sports turf they want to go and be a lawyer or be a, a plumber or electrician those sort of trades but not ours so it needs it and that's what we've built and we all effectively built a college yeah without the without the funding from a big yeah, yeah college funded for sure <laughs> they, they get a lot of a lot of money <laughs> yeah, um, but i mean with, with everything that you sort of 
put together. And like you said, with a, we're, we're just a high school, so it's, it's not even close to anything like you just described. Um, but we're trying to do similar things where we bring those different aspects to, again, the youth of America, especially here in Northern Virginia, um, just giving them the opportunity to, I mean, get on a mower, you know, even something yeah. like that, even something little like that can just play a massive role in a kid's day, especially when you're talking about a high school setting, being in a classroom for seven hours in a day and being able to go out and manage our fields and be a part of that. Um, it's, yeah. it's definitely incredible to see. Um, yeah. Like you said, you sort of are tailor make, making it to your kids. What would it be like for one of say one of our students or someone to come over and be a part of the Academy, say for a summer, um, what would that look like in the sense of an internship? Would they be more on the hands-on on the field type, or would it be more of a, a hybrid in the classroom, whatever, or are you even breaking it down even more than that, where it's going to be whatever you really want, we're going to do, but at the same time, it's still in your domain of what's going on. If that makes sense, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that, yeah, no, that makes sense. That's fine. And, and it sort of encapsulates everything that is possible really for what we're trying to provide here. And I guess the beauty of us being in our infancy is, is that we can be really flexible. So, you know, whilst, you know, if, if any of the guys over there wanted to learn something for specific, you know, we have the facility to educate and train them in those specific fields. Um, and very much it's about writing. So we're hoping that over the course of time, we'll develop programs that become things that people want to come and be part of. And we, we have them on the shelf and we'll expose them when we launch properly. Um, but also if, if, if there's something specific like you guys come to us and said one of our guys is really interested in trials and research or is really interested in hybrid pitches or cool season grasses or whatever you know we can bespoke something to them that forms part of or an add-on to maybe coming over for the summer and learning with us um, and that's the beauty of what we're doing it's it, we make the rules right so you know and you'll be certificated at the end of it because we're accredited by the, the awarding bodies over here so you know, it's it's really sort of unique in a sense of that I don't want to stop anybody learning anything. So we will set we will set the protocol for this sort of standard stuff that will be great and it will be probably more than anyone else there offers. If someone's got a real aspiration to even to understand what I do and how I work and the, the, my role, we'll do management programs with me and where we have invite guest speakers and we even have talked about having our manager of the football club in to do some leadership um, courses. So we we how do you manage footballers how do you manage people that is an art form in itself so the opportunities really you know if, if one of your guys wanted to come over for a summer that can be tailored to them individually or they can undertake one of our courses which will launch in july um and you know that can be six weeks three months you know a year um and you know we offer that we'll offer those opportunities out and you know even there's, there's reciprocal things that maybe you guys could do with us and you know give our guys some experience across the pond i might be coming over i mean yeah you come on over come over we'll no you up. yeah and if ever if you want to do anything with I, we are open for whatever i mean facilitating wise i'd have to figure out with the county but that'd be awesome that'd be great yeah and that's i mean i've obviously followed you guys for a while now and you know seeing what you you guys do and having a lot more sort of interest in looking at it you know this there's a lot of synergy there as far as i can see the the, the programs that you guys are running is it's really inspirational stuff for us because in the uk it's a completely different model it's uh it's something that we could learn from you know, could learn a lot from and you know the backing and support that you guys have got is something that you know we've had to go looking for but it's something that seems to happen over there and that's great because ultimately we're all working towards the same thing which is inspiring people into the industry to feed the industry which we all love Absolutely. Uh, and, and again, that means the world to us uh, coming from you, especially with what you've developed. It's incredible. Um, yeah. and again, if, if you have the educational system, I wouldn't mind talking to whoever uh, to try and get programs like this at even the lower level for high schoolers and whatnot. Um, yeah. Just just let me know. Um, Absolutely. With sort of everything, um, and you really answered a lot of it, um, with budgeting, leadership, uh, is there anything else that you see? Uh, again, you're not, you haven't even started it technically, but down the road, I mean, honestly, it's probably a, a moot question because you have people graduating with their PhDs and whatnot from your school. So um, is there anything like an end game type of goal that you're looking for 
uh, especially for you, for the person who created it, you know, who had the who had the pillars and who had the idea. Is there an end game to sort of what the the sports academy sports turf academy will have for uh, the club and for you specifically? Yeah, I mean, for for me, I, I just want I want I want the the car- career that I've chosen and that I love to be a real choice for people to come into and and be taken into consideration as a, as a real career, which it is. I know it is because I'm involved, but I want I want people coming through schools to be fully aware of what the potential can be in this industry and where it can take you and you know, the opportunities that it, that it offers. And I think for me, you know, I'd, I'd be over the moon if, if this concept sat within every Premier League football club. You know, if, if every, everyone got on board and seen that the actual, the, you know, this is it. This is a business model. This works. This is self-sustaining. You know, we don't. We're not here to turn over hundreds of millions of pounds. But what we are here to do is sustain our operation. Because if I can prove that model, if I can prove that you don't have, you might have to make an initial investment into a building or a facility. But actually, you can embed that into your current facility and still operate the model. Um, you know, and that for me would be to have that. If we had it in every Premier League football club. And even some of the the teams above that, you know, that gives a scope across the whole country to invite talent and, and feed the industry and feed the, you know, feed the, the demand, if you like, for for good people. Um, and I, I think it just makes our industry better and and higher profile and held in higher regard and taken more seriously. And that really is the ambition. You know, like I said, this it's not a vanity project. It's not something I don't want my name to be in light here. I just want the industry to to have something that they can be proud of. Um, and we are young and we haven't got going yet. And, you know, we've got a lot to do and a lot to learn. But you know, I'm pretty excited about what we can do. And I hope that other clubs will engage with it. So in terms of the end game, it's just about I want to know that when I retire, um, I've left a legacy somewhere and, and the club can leave a legacy. And the club have made a real bold statement with this. You know, this is something that's never been done before. Um, and we're truly unique. And the club is tre- truly unique as a club to work for. And you know, that synergy there has, has got us to the point we're at today. And I just hope that, you know, in, in years to come when I'm old and grey and retired, that I can look back and look at the industry and go, that's, that's in a better place than when I joined it, you know, 20, well, 60, 70 years ago, wherever it might be that I end up hanging me four up. <laughs> absolutely that's that's awesome uh and don't worry i've already gone gray at 26 so don't yeah. worry about, don't worry about <laughs> yeah. the gray part that, that <laughs> you got plenty of time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um sort of um i want to shift gears a little bit towards you specifically um again and i'm not trying to shed light on you obviously and again it's gonna you've already left your legacy and the fact that it's it's happened and that you were able to through your work convince and have them do something along this line you have done above and beyond of what a legacy is like um where did you get your passion for turf grass what 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 was it that brought you to the industry and how did you sort of get to this point in your career what was that that journey like from uh again i didn't start until college really and that's really late in the game really compared to my students now when was your journey sort of started and where'd you find all yourself? Where'd you find yourself uh, getting to the point where you are now with Leicester city? I mean, I, and this is a part of my story is, is brought into the reason why the turf Academy is here. Cause I, fa- I fell into the industry. I literally, I, had, I knew nothing about it to be honest. And I wanted to be, I wanted to be a footballer. That was my first aim. Like I guess most kids at school want to be a sports man, woman, you know, baseball be, player. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And, um, but, you know, unfortunately, when I was a young lad, I was pretty obese. <laughs> I look like, I look like Bruce Bogtrotter as a child, to be perfectly honest, from Matilda. I'm there now. It's all good. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, so I, I sort of said, I said to my dad at the time, I said, you know, I just want to get on the pitch. That's what I want to do. I just want to get on the pitch because most kids would want to just step foot on their local team's pitch and see what it's like to be a footballer. So he said to me at the time, he says, well, write a letter to the groundsman. And I was like, well, what's one of them? I have no idea what one of them is. And uh, so I wrote a letter when I was 13 years old and uh, I got accepted just to come up in the summer and help. And the industry is one of those things, and I'm sure you guys feel the same, is that once, once you take a step into it, it gets right under your skin. It's something that you just immediately fall in love with and you think, right, okay, I could do this as a career. And you know, I loved it. And, you know, I... 
so from there at 13, I then just become a, a regular pest to the groundsman. I was there every school holiday, every weekend, making tea, sweeping floors, doing all the rubbish jobs, basically, just to be involved. And a lot of it was because I wanted to be involved in the environment of football as well. So that was that. And, you know, I still I still did really well at school. I left school with, um, I was a straight A student at school. So I was heads on for like being a, you know, a lawyer or a doctor or something, but I'd already made my mind up. I wanted to go in sports turf and did. I followed my dream and um, you know, very quickly at Co Coventry City at the time this was, um, I went through an apprenticeship programme and, and went through my, my college courses really, really quickly. And within three years, I was sort of, sort of deputy head. I think it was probably the best way to describe the position. I was a number two and um, in charge of uh, Coventry City's training grounds at a very young age. Um, and I was cocky and I was, you know, arrogant and horrible as a teenager, as a lot of us are. Um, but I learned so much at that point. And yeah, and that's, you know, my career progressed then as I moved to Aston Villa uh, as a number two. Uh, I don't know whether any of you are aware of Jonathan Calderwood, who works at Paris Saint-Germain. He used to be at Aston Villa. He's one of the a really sort of, he's got a great reputation over this side of the, the world. Um, and I learned so much from him. And then I went back to Coventry City where my old manager got the, um, well, he left. Let's say he left because I'm being recorded. He left. And um, and then I applied for his job and uh, I got it. And I was, I was the, at that point, I was appointed head groundsman of a, a English football league club at 23 years old. And um, so I'd gone full circle back. So at that point, I was the youngest head groundsman in the country. Um, something that I'm really proud of today. And I was really proud of then. Um, spent four years there at Coventry City um, and managed a stadium, training ground, concerts, events at the stadium, seen it all, seen the real sort of tough end of the spectrum. And then when I was, I had an aspiration to be in the Premier League by the time I was 30. Um, and just not long after my 28th birthday, I got the opportunity at Leicester and I, I got the job. And uh, fast forward seven years and here I am. So that's all my journey if you like it's and, and a lot of like i said the aspiration from the inspiration for the sports Turf academy come from trying to remove that falling into it as aspect i want it to be a proper choice you know and like what you guys are doing is infiltrating high school kids to to make it a choice and that, that's really really inspirational stuff something that, that we're aspiring to and we're well behind here but something that i want to lead the way on to sort of to do and that's it's all part of my story really so uh, absolutely and, that, and that's again that's why we started i mean it's been i think it's the fourth year so i mean it's it's just been it's been a whirlwind for us just getting started you know and i'm sure you guys are getting gonna have that whirlwind very fast once uh, <laughs> july rolls around um with that um you are you've been a mentor to a lot of people even at a young age you know a lot of uh managers uh there's a couple that are on Twitter, I believe. I'm not sure who it is, but again, they they work with you and just sort of being that individual as their mentor. What does that mean to you? And again, with being the head of everything and having that academy, what what does it mean to be a mentor to that next generation of sports turf manager? Uh, probably the most important thing for me, um, it, 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 aside from all the responsibility that I have um, which we've touched on, you know, people are your most important asset. That's it. They are. Um, and if you don't invest in them, they'll never invest in you. Um, if you don't make them part of a dream or a vision, they'll never come on the journey with you. So for me, um, you know, I, I want to be the mentor that I probably didn't have, if I'm being honest, uh, you know, and, you know, I thank my previous manager, you know, at Coventry because I learned such a lot from his mistakes and I don't mean that he, he wasn't terrible, but, you know, at a young age when you're coming through, you know, he, he mentored me in a, in a way that sort of, I learned a lot more from the mistakes he was making rather than learning the way to do things from the way he handled himself. Um, and that was just his unique way. And that's, you know, no disrespect to him or anything, but for me, um, there was a lot of elements of my early career that I watched the way people were treated and vowed that I would never treat anybody that way. And myself included wasn't you know, partic treated particularly well. And as I hold my hands up, I wasn't the easiest to deal with because I was, you know, as a teenager, I was quite cocky and maybe a bit overconfident and, and all the rest of it. 
Um, so you live and learn. But equally, I always made that vow that, you know, if I was ever in charge, that I would treat people with the respect that they deserved and with the way that I'd like to be treated. And that's that's how I've gone about sort of mentoring my staff. And I see so much value in empowering people. You know, as you see a lot of this management technique where it's all me, 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 and I'm the boss and look at me, you know. And I always say to my staff, like, my name's above the door and I can't help that but I will always thrust you into situations that will test your resolve. Um, but when you get the rewards out the other end, you'll be the ones that get that reward, not me. And I will take a step back. And very much when you start a role like I did at Leicester, you know, I lead from the front and that was what I had to do. I had to lead from the front. I had to be the hardest working first in, last out, working late at night, working early in the mornings because I had to tread the boards and I had to prove that I was willing to do something um, and that I wouldn't ask anyone else to do if you know like, I wouldn't ask anyone to do a job I haven't done myself at any point so I've done pretty much everything and I mean everything um, and now as I, in my position as I've moved forward I've empowered people to take that responsibility and now I feel like I sort of steer the, steer the ship from the back I let them have their moments they're the ones that get the opportunities to go on the trips and the seminars and all the things that I got to do when I was leading from the front because there's so much power in empowering people um, and if you are, I'm fully, you know, comfortable in my own skin, I'm comfortable in my own position, I'm comfortable with how I built something. And, you know, I, I want other people to experience what that feels like. So it's really, really important to me as a, as a mentor for my staff, if that's what you want to call it, you know, which is a, a compliment really for me. Um, you know, it's, it's a, such an important part for their development because I want them to be better than me. I want, I want people to, to take what they've learned from me and, and be better and because that will drive the industry there's no point me being at the forefront because then what happens if I stop being enthusiastic or I want to take a back step and spend more time with my family and concentrate on balancing my life a bit more who's going to pick up the mantra if, if I just stop then if I haven't empowered people we'll all stop so, you know that's the way that why I adopt my management style here is is not to not to steal the limelight not to not to put people down not to pe keep people in a box or in a cage this is about empowering them and that reaps rewards for me because it allows me to do more and take on more because my headspace is clear because these guys have taken that responsibility from me and ultimately I've got their back. I sort of, I shield the, well, sorry if I'm swearing, I shield the shit coming down <laughs> and uh, I keep it away from their door and I let them take the compliments when they come um, and, you know, I see that as a really important part of my role and people are your most valuable asset. And if you don't treat them properly, you don't treat them with respect, you won't get anywhere. Trust me, you might for a little while, but you'll get caught out in the end. Yeah. And I, I can't agree with you more. I always tell the kids, I'm, I'm like, uh, you guys are the ones steering. You're the one in charge. I'm here to sort of make sure you don't screw things up. And uh, <laughs> when you when we have big successes, it's on you. But when you run into a fence and break something that's on me, you know, stuff like that, where it's, 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 it's different for me in a sense. Cause again, they're high schoolers and these guys are younger and it's the first time getting on machines and stuff. So yeah. um, definitely I think empowerment is the key uh, to keeping uh, interest. And again, it's, I think it's fantastic what you've done, especially when you were talking earlier about how you were building sea grave and having those meetings on a weekly basis. That's not, normal for a grounds manager to have that on their plate you know and then you being able to trust those guys that are going to be at king power the ones that are at the old training facility making sure that everything's still running by doing having those practices and having that leadership style i think that's what's really it speaks volumes to what you've been able to accomplish and i think a lot more people would benefit from operating it that way so i think that's that's incredible so um it's, it's, it's like I said it's it's about it ultimately benefits me to take on more and the res and diversify my role by allowing people to take that responsibility you know like a, we haven't really touched on it but you know I, I've got an involvement with um the club over in Belgium so it's allowed me to do that and build that infrastructure and it's also you know I'm involved with our our owners have got two polo fields in London and I've, I've started to have involvement in that as well so there's a lot on my plate, but equally around that, I've got loads of really good people sat around me and that's there's such an important part of our success. And I'll call it our success. It's not mine, but we're all a part of each other's success. And, you know, it's uh, I'm, I'm eternally thankful for the people I've surrounded myself with. And, you know, I hope that I've, I've done them a good turn by uh, looking after them and teaching them as well. Absolutely. Eyes not in my vocab when I write <laughs> anything, you know, so. Um, 
we'll take a little sidetrack. What is it with the team in Belgium and with, uh, is it just based on the owner's needs and where he needs you type of thing? And, uh, how is that still, how is that team working with you and are you working with them and ensuring that again, you're having that same, I'm sure since everything at Leicester city has gone so well, he wants you making sure everything else again, the polos and whatnot, what is it that you're working on outside of, I guess the, the, the umbrella of Leicester city. So, so yeah, so what happened, we obviously, like you say, we're building this reputation and doing things well, you tend to get a bit more responsibility. That's what happens. And so pretty much anything that the owners purchased that has anything green in terms of turf, um, it, I'm the first person they pick the phone up to. So, you know, four years ago, we acquired a club in Belgium. Um, and some the reasons behind why we acquired the club, I'm still not 100% sure, but, you know, the owners wanted to, and maybe there's reasons behind it that maybe are above my pay grade. I don't know. Um, but I was flown out the next day um, to establish this, uh, you know, a department and build infrastructure similar to what we'd done at Leicester, build that five-year plan that we'd done. It's almost become a bit of a trademark of mine internally. Um, and yeah, so we've uh, went out there and again, significant investment in, in the pitches, in the training facility. Um, this year, um, actually, we got approval today um, to reconstruct the stadium pitch over there, which is great because that pitch is 50 years old and it's an old athletics track so it is bad um, and the guys over there who are looking after it have worked miracles so we've got we've got two English guys out there looking after the the pitch um, in the first instance when we arrived we had to use some of our staff to get, ship them over to Belgium and I was out there I reckon well, you'll ask my wife and she'll tell you how what a strain it was I think I was out there once a week for the first six months so I was flying out maybe every Thursday, coming back on a Friday, having meetings, putting all the infrastructure in place, recruiting staff, buying machinery, finding local suppliers. Yeah, it was quite um, quite the strain, to be perfectly honest, um, in the first instance. And then as we started building that team, I've stepped more and more away to allow them again that empowerment to sort of run their own. And um, I just, you know, it's got to a point now, four years down the line, where I've sort of like almost like a oversight of, of what goes on I see I still have involvement in the budgets the big capital projects um, I'm involved in and you know I'm, I'm a soundboard for the staff if they want to run something past me or they want to look at programs they want some advice they want some support I'm on the end of the phone um, I haven't only because of COVID I haven't been out there since last Christmas um, but typically I go out there every two to three months physically um, but it takes about a day a week of my sort of time and headspace um, and then, yeah, maybe two years ago, I got invited down to our, our owner's polo farms, of which he's got two, um, two separate venues. Um, but just to put it into context, one polo pitch, you may know this already, but one polo pitch is the equivalent of five football pitches. So he's got four pitches. So there's the equivalent of 20 football pitches down there in area. Um, it's also, a bit, yeah, a little bit yeah. big. Um, and a different discipline because these horses are phenomenal athletes as much as the athletes are. Um, so, yes, yeah, so again, a bit heavier, a bit heavier. A bit more traction, yeah. <laughs> a bit, yeah, and a little bit more detrimental to the surface as well. But so, you know, our owner's got aspirations and he's a really sort of forward thinking guy and he sort of wants hit King Power Polo to be at the forefront of new technologies and looking after horses. So, we're adopting a similar style to what we've done at Leicester where we're looking at the horse's interaction with the surfaces and how we can improve that to increase performance. So that's, that's forming part of what I'm doing down there. And now what we've done as part as proxy of part of launching the Turf Academy is some of the services that are in the Turf Academy are wrapped up in the polo farm. So that will also provide our students some opportunities to work in polo as much as it is to work in golf, football or golf culture. So it's a really sort of, it's exciting, it's different, it's a very affluent um, sort of uh, sport you know it's lots of lots of rich people take part in it um so I'm not, I don't quite fit in I just sit under the radar um <laughs> so you know it's it's another it's just another really interesting learning curve really really interesting and it's really good because I said I've, I've fortunately built a reputation within the club that you know if there is anything green then I'm the first one to get the call. And I, I love that. I love helping. I love, you know, making a difference. And, and that's what drives me with all these other projects. And then again, with having the headspace, because I've empowered people, I can do it and I can do it well. Um, and I can build structure around me that supports the operation. And that's been a real sort of key part of that success. So that's the, 
the sidelines, if you like, aside from Leicester City. I'm employed by Leicester ah, City. I'm not employed ah. by anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that I had a lot to do in a high school setting. No, that's that's awesome. I mean, I love how you're talking about how you're taking that similar practice and applying it to something completely different. And management-wise, you have to probably do 15 different things that you would never do to a, a football pitch. You know, it, it, yeah. I can't even we don't want to comprehend it honestly. <laughs> just, I, I i applaud you for that yeah. um we were sort of talking about how you're empowering your workers and whatnot um and our students are currently in that stage where we've got i think we have now almost 20 kids uh doing internships whether it's a golf course uh someone just got hired at a minor league ballpark the other day Brilliant. um what is it that you're looking for in a student? And maybe, maybe I'll tailor make it to the academy. What are you looking for in, say, a student who's trying to join the academy? Or what are you looking for in a person when you're trying to hire them onto your staff? Um, maybe it's in the interview process. Maybe it's just sort of what is it that you're looking for specifically to ensure that you can empower them and trust and trust that person with that sort of power? Yeah. And so for me, um, we always employ the person. We don't employ the qualifications. Um, qualifications are really important, you know, obviously with education. But, you know, what you find is that you can train people to, to achieve a qualification. What you can't change is people's personality and their core values. Um, so when we're recruiting, you know, we've worked on internally just as in our department, we've created a set of core values that, have, that all the staff um, have signed up to and been part of building in terms of a, a structure and an ethos and a value piece that we all adhere to and some standards that we all hold ourselves to. So when we, you know, when we go through that interview process, we won't take someone on the value of a, a resume or a CV. You know, we'll, we'll speak to the person and we'll look at what them in the eye across the table and we'll see if they, you know, if we can develop them, if we can make them better, but more importantly, if they want to, if they want to get better and they want to be developed. And that for me is, that's how we recruit. Um, and that's how we would look to people that anyone that wants to engage with the academy is, is that what do you want? It's the first question we ask. What do you want from us? It's not about what we want from you. It's about what you want from us. Where do you want your career to go? Where do you want to go here? What are your aspirations? What are your dreams? And for me, and, and the beauty of, of what we've created and, and sort of thing that sort of keeps me going is the fact that we can do that for young people. We can take their dreams and aspirations and help them make that a reality. Um, and that is it's a really sort of important part of our recruitment process in whether it's staff, whether it's a, a sports staff academy students, that'll be what we always come back to that, that set of principles that we've developed as a team, as a team of, you know, a, a much smaller team and grown into. And we, we ask all the staff to, you know, when we, when we recruit the staff, we ask them to sign up to those core values. We taught them through what they are. And we ask them to sign up to it. And, you know, you can usually tell from looking someone across the aisle virtually now as we have to do our interviews at the minute, <laughs> um, whether they've got it in them. And, and, you know, and that's how we do it. You know, it's uh, you can have a degree. That's fine. But, you know, you could be an a-hole, couldn't you? <laughs> I'm trying not to swear. <laughs> But you could, and I can't. I can't. They've heard, they've heard worse, so it's okay. okay. <laughs> I, can't, I can't. I can't train you not to be an asshole, but I can train you to be a good member of staff and train and upskill you to give you the skill set to produce good playing services. But I can't stop you in an asshole, so we won't recruit you in that sense. <laughs> no, I, I agree. <laughs> there's there's been many times in my career I turn I'm like, how did you get here again? Like <laughs> just because <laughs> yeah. of the person they are, and it's like. Man, they missed it on that one, but uh, yeah. yeah, no. Um, the other thing that sort of goes into that, and with again, we empowerment seems to be the running theme throughout this conversation. How do you, through such a long season, you know, from August to May, and then again, probably it's even more focused from May to the uh, August to the start of the season, or May to August. I can't think, I apologize. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, what is it that you're doing to sort of um, keep them motivated? You know, it's such, it's a, it's a, it's a love by trade type of thing. And you, you have yeah. to love what you do, obviously, but even in that, and there have been times where like, I'll have like a 10 game homestand working for the pirates. And I'm like, Oh, geez, <laughs> I need yeah. some time to breathe. And then the, uh, they go on the road. We're doing all of our cultural air rating, top dressing, all those things. It's, 
And again, I loved doing it, but there were moments where I was like, man, I got to like wake myself up and get back to it. You know, what is it that you're doing to ensure that you're getting the most out of your, and again, I'm, like, employees sounds bad, but like no, no, no. Your, your coworkers, you know? Um, I mean, the thing, the thing, the real focus for us as a department and as a club is, is making sure that people have a work-life balance, you know, because I love my job. I really love my job, but I also love my family and, you know, it's really important that you you balance that, and and we make a real we make a real effort um, with all of our staff to look after their mental well being, and we make sure that we look after their their thought processes, and we wrap them in a lot of support networks as well, so that you know they've all got access to sort of online counselling, telephone counselling, someone to talk to, medical insurance. We, you know, we we wrap a lot around them and we, we incentivize them a lot to, to be good people and to have balance in, and in their lives. And, you know, th- th- I can go and motivate them by giving them a rousing talk and saying, you know, come on guys, you know, we can do this and stick with it and this that, and the other. But actually what you find is, is that by looking after the f- foundations of a person and making sure that they feel valued, they feel appreciated and also they're delivering results because, you know, my job is to make sure that the mechanism works so that they can produce the results. So we put all the building blocks in place to make sure that they can do their job so that nothing breaks down so that, you know, when they need to do something, they have everything they need to do it. So that side of it is one motivation. The other bit comes from, you know, how we communicate to the staff, how we talk to them, how we motivate them physically, where I can come and you know, say, come on, guys, we're going to do this. We've got this to look forward to. You know, the owner's coming over. We've got a game. We've got, it's the biggest thing. We can do all that. Um, but actually, the, the foundations of keeping people motivated is just valuing them, making them feel appreciated. And, you know, for example, like, you know, on occasions, what we'll do is we'll, I'll just buy them all pizza, <laughs> you know, or we'll just do, <laughs> we'll do something. We'll, I'm going to be we'll, honest. It works with the kids. I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you does. can ask him. You can ask Ben right there. Ben, it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, and it and it does. And it, you know, those sort of there are only little things, and it doesn't have to be extravagant. It doesn't have to be necessarily paying everybody fortunes of money. It's about making people feel part of something. And that and because we've built a culture, and because what we are we are founded on is culture and value, and they bought into that. And that all comes as proxy and they stay motivated because they bought into the culture. They know that if I'm asking them to walk, you know, 64 miles a week, they know that there's a reason for it. They know I'm not doing it to be an asshole. They know I'm not doing it to crack the whip and say, you must walk this and you must do that. This is, they know that it's for a reason. Everything we do has a reason and a purpose and it's been planned for. So I think that's how we motivate and we're really organized. We're really well regimented and that gives Staff a lot of security too. They feel like they're in good hands with us, with me and my management team, to lead them in a direction that is going to give them kudos and actually make them better and you know make them proud of what we're producing. Um, you know, and I'm not being funny, but you know, if you were to turn up at Seagrave every day of the week, I think you'd be pretty pumped to come to work, right? <laughs> so, like I am. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I would oh, yeah. I would say so. I'm pumped to go to my school, so it doesn't look like exactly. that. Obviously, my my buildings. I think it's. 67 years old or something. It's the oldest really? in our county. So it's it's a little broken down. <laughs> we just we just say it's got a little bit of a culture to it, you know, a little yeah, yeah. You know, a little weathered. Bit. I think that's perfect. That's the word. I couldn't <laughs> think of it. So um we try and keep the grass green. That's that's <laughs> that's it. That's the big goal. Um sort of with again, with again coming up with the next generation and even with your experience in your career. Um, you're part of a couple different organizations. We obviously discussed the GMA. You're also part of the European Stadium and Safety Managers Association. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay, I said it right. Look at that. <laughs> um, how has this sort of played a role in your career, especially the past uh, seven years at Leicester City? And how is that knowledge and the education and then the actual work and training and everything that sort of you do with your academy and with your crew just in general how has those organizations played a role in development and being a part of that yeah and that's you, you've hit the nail on the head really it's, it's been a lot of people get a lot of gratification by being part of something feeling part of something um, and the gma you know they've really evolved in the past few years they've come from an organization that maybe was a little bit behind the times maybe sort of maybe 10 12 years ago where people didn't really know what they did 
you know, what what is it? What's your purpose? Um, and, you know, they've had a new chief executive come in and he's really drove the, the sort of the vision forward. Um, you know, he's not from a sports turf background, but he's really sort of professionalised that operation. And you know, it's really important that, you know, we buy into those organisations and that we we support them because they're there to look after our best interests and they're there to sort of support us. And, you know, what what they give us and what organisations like ESMA give us is opportunity to network and opportunity to share best practice and talk to other people that do our job and, you know, inspire other people and be inspired by others. And, and that's sort of core of what they do. You know, like when we have Soltex, which is the GMA's uh, event they hold every year, and then we have the award ceremony on the evening of those of those uh, exhibits. Um, it's just a chance for us all to get together. And it is a chance for us all to, you know, maybe drink too much and talk turf for long into the night. But it's, it's part of the process. And it's part of, like I said, the ultimate thing about those organisations is feeling like you belong to something. And most human characteristics and, and people want to feel ownership. It's like, you, you're there wearing sort of your logo and you're proud, like I'm proud of belonging to the football club. And, you know, those those organisations make you feel like you're part of something and part of something that can influence change. And that's uh, that's why they're so important. And they're, they're a key part to my success. I was on the, the GMA's Young Board of Directors for a period of time and they were set up to help shape the industry and bring new people into it. And, uh, you know, I'm too old for it now. I'm, I'm not on the, I'm on the old board of directors. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's... Uh, they, they, they play, play a key role in, in getting new people into industry and, in, and sort of like I say giving us that belonging and that central place to to bring everyone together you know so that's, yeah they're just they are important and it's uh, they're great they give us great opportunities to to network and to expand our knowledge and understand and learn from other people absolutely that's 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 great that they and it's it's really nice when the organizations help in a sense of again being a part of the system, you know, a part of making it better, especially with like we talked about the grounds week, you know, that's those little things. Like, I feel like they do wonders of, again, putting sports turf and turf management in front of so many more people, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's definitely good to see. Um, we sort of wrap it up with these last two questions. And with this one, I have no idea how you're actually going to answer it because you do so much and how you are a part of so much. Um, if there was anything that you could tell yourself when you start off sort of maybe even at Leicester city or when you first started sort of in hindsight, what would you tell yourself to make maybe not easier, but better understand what's ahead um, and better prepare yourself to again, make things, I guess, I don't, I don't know if it's better because you've already made it amazing. So I don't know, yeah. whatever, if you understand what I'm trying to say. I know, I get, I get exactly what you mean. And I, I mean, to be fair, I've often thought about this question myself. And I think that, you know, whilst every mistake that I've made and, and every, you know, path that I've chosen has, has led me to, to here now, retrospectively from now that I sit in a management position and I manage people, I think it would be um, the bit of advice I'd give myself when I was a lot younger is to, to look at things from other people's perspective because I was really sort of because I was so driven I was really selfish and actually all I really cared about at that point was my my own progression and I didn't sort of I would give my managers a hard time because I wanted to progress and it was about me and I wanted more and give me give me give me and you know I never took the time to stop and reflect and think about how that affected them and how that affected them managing me um, because although, like I say, you know, my career path has been it's been great and I've achieved a lot and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I learned quite late on, well, not late on, but, you know, when I got into management at sort of 23, 24, real management, um, I've seen things from the other side. And I think that's the, probably the only thing that I would say to sort of, and it's not necessarily to change my career path, but to maybe have made me a better person in those early years is to just take a bit of perspective and look at it from another angle and, you know, there are things you learn maybe as you get old uh, and wiser like I am now and you know I read more books and uh, you know I look I read more on the human condition and and I'm more aware of stuff like that now but you know, back then I was so self-absorbed and running at a thousand miles an hour I never actually stopped and took step took stock of anyone else around me so I think that's probably the only thing that I would say to my younger self is just take time for the people you know, it's not all about you um, and although it's led me to the path I'm at now I think you know it, in those early years, it would have made me a much more well-rounded person. And actually, I may not have employed myself if I'd have 
put myself in front of myself when I was younger, I probably would have went, Jesus Christ, I'm going to avoid him like the plague. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that's probably the best bit of advice I'd give myself for sure. No, and I think that's great because, and I, and I'm not, I don't know if it's the right thing to say, but with the program and with the kids, I, I try and put that in perspective in the sense of everything you do is sort of seen and the way you conduct yourself, not in my classroom uh, and not in a specific space, wherever it is, people will see, people will judge, people will take note and sort of label that on you. You know, like you said, if you weren't going to hire yourself, like it, it's important to conduct oneself with, uh, I mean, just being a good person in general, you know, and it's, I know the golden rule is the most over said thing on everything is treat those treat others the way you want them to treat you. I know, again, people will laugh at it, but it's, it's really true. And I, yeah. it makes the biggest difference in the world. Um, and again, I, I can't agree with you more again with having your own understanding of your surroundings. There are so many things going around, going on in the world right now that it's important to understand that and really with covid it put things in perspective in a sense you know uh being shut down having that time to think and being like well this is happening right now and yeah what am i doing you know like so again i i appreciate again the self-awareness is huge and that's yeah, awesome that's something um, that i think we could all we could all work on and it's like say something that we've we've all come to learn maybe through lockdown and through having all we've got is work and home work and home um, and that's been a real focus for us as well because we've had to make we've worked all the way through covid and we've had to make that uh, work a bit of a special place to come to and keep people inspired and, and motivated because you know we don't want them to to suffer and we don't want them to go home and feel trapped or isolated so really important and you made a great point there drew about the fact that it's exactly the way that we operate is is that people are always watching and they're always forming opinions rightly or wrongly so the way you conduct yourself, the way you hold yourself is so important because it doesn't just reflect on you as a person. It reflects on everybody that you're associated with. And I said to my guys, you know, we, the whole of that new building has got a glass front. It's just full of glass. And all the most important people at the football club are looking out onto what we're doing. So even when it comes to using their phones, because, you know, young people are addicted to mobile phones. And even I find myself, I have to be because my emails just don't stop. Um, but, you know, I say to them, you know, if they look out the window and I've worked so hard to get this amount of staff in the door and support you and this and the other and all you're doing is you're out on your phone all the time, you know, that's a reflection on me and on us and it will come back on all of us. So, yeah, you make an absolute great point there to say that, you know, you, you people are constantly looking at you rightly or wrongly and it's you can you can mould what they think and, that, and what they think of you and their opinion on you by how you hold yourself. So, great yeah. point. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with the whole sort of like organizational standpoint you know i i tell the kids when you walk out of this classroom guess who your teachers call it's me you know because <laughs> they know you're in my class they know that you're a representation of what the turf program is you gotta understand the way you do stuff out there is how it comes back to me yeah. and i don't i don't like when i get emails from teachers guys okay when it's bad <laughs> only good stuff only good stuff <laughs> so we usually ended on this uh, question, uh, especially since all, a lot of our kids are young. Um, even I, a lot of them are five weeks away from graduating high school. You know, uh, it's a very pivotal point in the kid's life. Um, could you sort of give whatever best words of wisdom you could give to a, to a kid who's looking at the future sort of dead in the face and whether it's going for school or college or university or uh, entering an industry or even just figuring out what they're doing with their life, what would that be? And how would you see, say that would be uh, a major um, upside of again, approaching what's to come? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's about, it's about what I, what I call and what I say to a lot of my staff and a lot of the young guys that we have, it's about treading the boards. Um, it's about sort of doing everything, experiencing everything you know, if you've got aspirations to, to be in management, you know, being able to ask someone to do something that you've done 1,500 times, you know, is really important because it, then it comes from a really solid place, a really solid foundation. And it's really important that through those formative years where you are doing a lot of the work and a lot of the hard work, you know, um, people often say, oh, you got lucky. Um, but I found that the harder I work, the luckier I got. And that's, that's the truth, you know. 
And, you know, I guess the one thing that I, another sort of sort of strap line that I use with the staff is, is that I always say to them that remember that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. So always push yourself out of your comfort zone. Never sit in a box. If you want to get on and you want to progress and you want to, you know, make a difference in your own life is, is push yourself outside your comfort zone. Do something that you're not necessarily comfortable with because you learn so much more from that than just going through the motions of doing things on a day to day basis. So I say that one a lot to my, my team, you know, you like just begin at the end of your comfort zone for sure. And that's how I've so far that I've sort of tried to do that myself. And I'm, I'm inherently, you know, by personality trait, I'm an introvert. I'm quite sort of, believe it or not, <laughs> I'm, I'm an introvert. And, um, you know, I've had to learn and develop the skill of sort of really pushing myself into situations I might not be comfortable with and learn from them. And that's, that's helped me throughout my career so much. So fed the boards and push the comfort zone is, is something that I think I'd hope that people can take with them and uh, take through life in whatever scenario it throws at you, whether it's sports stuff or industry or just in general, you know, push yourself to be the best version of yourself you can be. Absolutely incredible. And again, I, I want to say thank you so much, especially because it got really late and I wasn't paying yes. attention at the time. I'm so sorry. Uh, this was beyond incredible. And I know all of our students will love listening to it. Uh, for those that we had a spring sports start this week. So it's like about 50, 60 kids that are probably on a field right wow. now. Um, so we can't thank you enough. We had a blast. And uh, again, this, I can't thank you enough, honestly. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity and thanks for everyone that stuck with it. And uh, I know it's been a long day, so I appreciate it and uh, listening to me. So yeah. Listen, and if any of you guys want to be in touch, you know, share details, fine by me. If they want to ask questions, then listen, I'm all for that. So hopefully we might see some of you at the Sports Tech Academy and maybe some of our guys might, you might see some of our guys out there with a bit of luck. So keep doing the good work. You're doing a great job. And I'm watching all the time with interest. <laughs>